Okay, well, welcome everyone. Today, Stephanie Goodrich is going to talk to us about dementia. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you're on whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my name is Stephanie Goodrich, as Kate said, and I have been an occupational therapist for six years. I work in inpatient rehab and at an acute care hospital, a couple of them. And I've had a good deal of experience working with people with dementia in these settings. And this is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and I want to open up right away with actually a question for you. What are your experiences with working with people with dementia? And do you have any primary concerns that you want to address today? That would be for you, Daniela. I don't know if you're working in pediatrics or adults right now. Do you have any concerns? Hello, I'm in pediatric now. You're in pediatrics, okay. Okay. Pediatric and adult, adult stroke. Adult stroke, okay. So this will be that adult population too. There's a lot of comorbidity with stroke and dementia. So I want to start with a story to get us thinking. And this is a story that is intended to help us get into the mind frame of somebody experiencing dementia and get an idea of what they might experience from day to day. Imagine going on a long train. You leave, the landscape looks familiar, and you sit back to relax. For a while you read, then you doze off. When you wake up from your nap, you notice something odd. When you look out the window, things look different. The buildings have strange shapes and colors, and the trees don't look right. You think perhaps the train is traveling through an area with different architecture and plant life, and it surprises you because you, don't, you didn't think you were going anywhere so different. You ask any other passengers about where you are, but they don't seem to be paying any attention to the changes. This makes you wonder if your mind is playing tricks on you. You decide to act as if everything is normal but since it is not, you feel tense. When the attendant asks if you would like something to eat, you snap at her. You think the food might be as strange as the surroundings and you don't want to take a chance. You go back to reading your book for a while and then you look up and out the window again and everything looks strange and unfamiliar. You get very scared. This is not the right train. You need to get off right now so you get up to leave the train. You don't get far before the other passengers get in your way and take, your back, take you back to your seat. You try explaining that you were on the wrong train, but they don't seem to understand. They just say, sit down and it's all right, but you know it isn't. You start to look through your purse for the train ticket to show the attendant what is wrong, but you can't find it. You take everything out of your purse and spread it around, but there's no ticket. Did someone take it? Some of the passengers try to help you, but they are looking at you with pity, and they are treating you like you are a baby. Someone tells you to take your medication, but you don't remember having any prescriptions. Maybe they just want to give you something that will knock you out. You tell the woman you won't take it, and, she gets mad. and you get scared, so you pretend to take the pills, but hide them in your hand until she leaves, and then you drop them on the floor. You have to get away from here. So you head to the door again. You almost make it back to the door, but just before you can open the door, hands pull you back. They march you back to your seat, yelling that you are acting reckless and that you need to sit still in your seat until the train stops. You realize you will never make it home. How sad you feel. You did not say goodbye to your family or your friends. They don't know where you are. A few of the passengers try to they say don't make sense, especially when they say everything is okay, because it isn't. You don't feel like eating or talking. When they want you to get up and do things, you are too afraid of where they might take you, so, they ref so you refuse to move. Some of them get angry then. You have no choice now. 
You have to go along on the train, no matter where it goes. You wish you had never gotten on this train, but you know you cannot go back. So let's start by talking what, about what dementia is. Dementia is a general term for progressive loss of brain function and impaired cognition. Impressive, progressive meaning that it's, it's only going to get worse. It can't get better. It usually occurs later in life, but sometimes it can be earlier. It's characterized by disorientation and impaired memory. Dementia also affects the ability to learn new information and eventually it impairs language, judgment, behavior, and functional ability. This functional ability includes activities of daily living like bathing and dressing and toileting. Could also include mobility and problem solving and social skills, so our ability to interact with people. Eventually, dementia leads to death, usually as a result of complications of impaired mobility aspiration pneumonia from impaired swallowing functions or opportunistic infection. And I want to point out here that dementia is different from delirium, although they can look very similar. Delirium is an acute fluctuating change in mental status that has a sudden onset and lasts from hours to days, but it does resolve. And dementia can happen for a variety, or I'm sorry, delirium could happen for a variety of reasons. It could be from cerebral or cardiovascular disease, infections, stress, sleep deprivation, dehydration. So we might see delirium in people who have something else going on medically, and it's affecting the way that their mind is functioning. But once that medical problem resolves, the delirium also resolves and their cognition returns to its prior level of functioning versus dementia, which has a, usually a slower onset and continues to become progressively worse over time. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of dementia. The most commonly diagnosed type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And this results from degenerative changes in the central nervous system leading to diffuse neuronal loss in the cerebral cortex and hippocampus. The exact cause is not known, but there have been plaques and tangles that have been found in the brain tissue of people with Alzheimer's through microscopic examination after death. So unfortunately, the only way that we can know that somebody has Alzheimer's disease is they've already died. Um, if you were to look at the microscopic makeup of the, the brain, then you could see that. But while they're still alive, that diagnosis is based on their symptomology, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on. Another very common type of dementia is vascular dementia. And this happens basically from a collection of small strokes or other vascular problems that decrease blood flow to the brain, causing damage to parts of the brain tissue. Usually with vascular we'll see gait problems, falls, and sudden changes in personality. Another common type of dementia is Parkinson's dementia, and this is due to Parkinson's disease. Now, somebody may have Parkinson's disease but not yet be showing signs of Parkinson's dementia. Um, that can come later, or it might be one of the first signs of Parkinson's disease is these uh, brain and cognition changes. And Parkinson's dementia is due to death of the dopamine producing cells in the substantia nigra and the acetylcholine producing cells in the pedunculopontine nucleus of the basal ganglia. Hopefully some of these terms sound familiar from your um, neuroscience and anatomy classes in school, kind of jogging your memory a little bit. Uh, Parkinson's dementia differs from Alzheimer's disease uh, because the memory is not necessarily primarily affected in Parkinson's dementia as it is in Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's dementia tends to interfere more with the ability to plan, maintain goal orientation, and make decisions. Another less common type of dementia is Lewy body dementia, and this is due to abnormal accumulations of certain proteins within neurons. They're called Lewy inclusion bodies. And this 
type of dementia differs from Alzheimer's disease in that the memory is not disproportionately impaired compared to other cognitive functions. The primary symptoms are more visual hallucinations, which can be very vivid, uh, fluctuating alertness, severe sleep problems that affects the, the part of the brain that controls sleep. And um, this can include insomnia, night cramps, and acting out dreams. Lewy body dementia also tends to cause uh, Parkinsonism, which kind of looks like Parkinson's disease, but it's from a different cause. It's from this Lewy body dementia versus the, the cause of what Parkinson's disease is related to with the dopamine deficits. And this Parkinsonism in Lewy body dementia could uh, look like rigidity or stiffness. You could see that shuffling gait, the tremor, and the bradykinesia, the slow movement that you would see in Parkinson's disease. There's also frontotemporal dementia, and this is going to affect the frontal and the temporal lobes more than other parts of the brain. Um, so if you can recall from school, the frontal and the temporal areas of the brain have a lot to do with the personality and controlling behavior and inhibiting inappropriate behaviors. So therefore, in this type of dementia, we'll typically see a lot of inappropriate behaviors. They might also have difficulty with speech uh, because the speech areas are uh, housed in the temporal lobe. Uh, may also have some motor abnormality similar to Parkinson's disease. And again, not as much difficulty with memory as you would see with Alzheimer's disease. Now, some forms of dementia may actually be reversible. So it's important when you're working with these patients um, to try to determine, is this something that's happening because of a true dementia process in the brain, or might there be something else going on that's making this not really a true dementia, but making this person appear like they have dementia when really it's something else going on that we might be able to treat in a different way and therefore help to resolve the dementia at the same time. Um, and I know it's a little bit confusing because earlier I said that dementia is irreversible, but these other possible causes of dementia, it's not true dementia, it's, it's kind of like a secondary dementia. Um, and this could be things like um, depression or sensory deprivation, uh, malnutrition and drug toxicity. So for instance, if somebody is um, an alcoholic where they're using alcohol um, and abusing alcohol, this can cause so much damage in the brain that they appear to have dementia. And some of that damage may be irreversible, but if they're treated for the alcoholism, you may actually see some improvement in the cognition as well. There are also some other types of dementia that aren't as common as the ones listed here. Uh, these include traumatic dementia, which can happen from multiple blows to the head, creutzfeldt jakob disease, which is a very rare and degenerative fatal brain disease. I'm not really gonna get into that as much today because it is very uncommon. Um, and you could also have dementia caused by HIV or syphilis or a variety of other diseases and disorders. So I know that's a lot of information. Are there any questions at this point? Are we still doing okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, it's great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I talked a little bit with David about what he, David Tomford, about what he went over with you all in your classes on dementia. Um, and it didn't seem that you got really far into the different types. So I just wanted to kind of give a broad overview of that. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about trying to determine the difference between, um, well, I've got my slides reversed here. I think we already mentioned a lot of what you see here. Um, the different causes of cognitive impairment that might not be dementia. So again, we mentioned delirium, um, depression. You could also see cognitive impairment with other neurological disorders like Huntington's disease and cerebral palsy, uh, stroke, traumatic brain injury, metabolic or hormonal issues, hydrocephalus, Down syndrome. And the reason that I wanted to list all of these is that Sometimes you may have a person who you know there's something not quite right with their cognition, but you don't know what's causing it. 
and it's important in the way that you're going to treat them to determine is this dementia, should I treat this person as one with dementia or is this cognitive disability coming from some other um, cause that you might need to treat in a different way. Uh, for instance, if it's you know a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, you might be doing more neuromuscular re-education, that sort of thing, versus dementia that you know isn't really going to change and you want to focus more on helping the person adapt to their situation and um, training the family members and caregivers on how this might um, look months or years down the road and how to adapt the lifestyle based on that. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the um, ways to identify if cognitive changes and memory impairment are just a part of normal aging or if they're indicative of dementia. Because as we get older, we forget more. <laughs> Um, and that's normal. It's normal to occasionally forget which word you were going to use or forget somebody's name that you might have just met the day before. Um, what makes it abnormal is when you become so forgetful that you are lost in what you're even trying to do within a day. So for instance, it's normal to sometimes lose your keys, your car keys, um, or something else that's important to you. I misplace things all the time. But it's not normal to forget what you're doing while you're looking for your keys. That might be a sign that there's something else going on that you might be starting to develop this dementia. And this is a really good list here. Um, from the Alzheimer's organization here in the States of typical age-related changes on the right versus signs of Alzheimer's or dementia, other types of dementia. So for instance, it's normal to make a bad decision once in a while to show a bit of impaired judgment when you do something that you realize later on you really shouldn't have. But when that poor judgment and decision making is almost all the time or start affecting your starts affecting your ability to safely engage in your daily life, that might be a sign of Alzheimer's. It's normal to forget what day it is and then remember later on, oh, that's right, today is Monday. We went to church yesterday. Yesterday was Sunday. But if you're losing track of the date and you're not even really sure what season it is, that's more of a sign of dementia. A lot of my, my patients, I'll kind of try to delve into a little bit more. If I ask them if they know what day it is, they, they might say no because they're in the hospital and, you know, they've had a lot of other things going on lately, and I'll, I'll give them that. But when I say, well, what holiday is coming up or what season are we in, and it's summer, and they say winter, then I know maybe there's something else going on. Maybe they are starting to develop or have already developed dementia. There's a um, link to a website at the bottom there that gives you a little bit more information about this. And I would recommend doing a little bit more research on that because this can be uh, really tricky to differentiate sometimes. Okay. So there's a couple of different ways of determining what stage of Alzheimer's or dementia, other dementia that somebody may be in. And this is important because knowing where they are in the disease process is going to impact what their needs are and what we're going to do um, as far as therapy interventions for them at that point. The most common way that I've seen is just three stages, early, middle, and late stage. You might also see um, staging as asymptomatic, the preclinical stage when they're not really showing signs yet, then the symptomatic pre-dementia stage where they're starting to show some signs of memory impairment, but it's not really affecting their um, everyday life yet. It's more mild cognitive impairment. And then the third would be the dementia phase. Um, and I want to point out here that somebody could show some of the symptoms in one stage, but also some in the next stage. And, it's not really clear cut. It's going to be um, 
different for everybody going through dementia. In the early stage, we're going to start seeing mild short-term memory loss. Typically, long-term memory remains for a long time. It's the short-term, the things that just happened that are starting to go. There might be some difficulty with word choice. Um, the person may have some difficulty remembering names of people that they just met or appointment times or repetition sometimes might be needed. Even though you just told somebody, they might ask, what, what was that you said? You might need to repeat it a few times for them to be able to remember. And usually this level of memory loss can be minimized with adaptation. So they can write themselves notes, they can keep a calendar and remember to look at that calendar to remember what's going on and what they need to do that day. Um, there might be some difficulty starting with complicated brain functions. And this would be things like calculations, uh, trying to add up the cost of something, for instance, or following multiple directions, or making quick decisions. They might start to need some extra time to decide something. Learning new tasks can start to become difficult, but the person might still enjoy familiar and well-known activities and simpler hobbies. There might start to be some difficulty with driving um, safely and some decline in job performance. They're not quite as quick and productive as they once were. And socially, they might be more comfortable with familiar people. They might seem socially intact to everybody except for those who know them really well and are starting to notice some, some different things. In this stage, they might also start to have some problems with gnosis and praxis. Um, in case you don't remember these words uh, from your schooling, no gnosis means recognizing and being able to name things, knowing what they're for, and praxis is motor planning. So being able to perform unfamiliar tasks and knowing what to do and how to carry out that action. In the middle stage, there's going to be more moderate memory loss. It's becoming more severe. They might have gaps in their personal history and we, recent events. So they might, it might be afternoon and they might forget what they did for the second half of the morning. Um, they might have more difficulty with language and more frequently have trouble finding the right words that they want to say. Uh, they might not be able to name common objects. They might be repeating themselves a lot. Um, and they might need to hear your question again and again to be able to understand it and formulate a response. They're starting at this point to have um, mild impairment with ADLs. They, towards the end of the stage, will eventually need help with toileting and hygiene and getting dressed. These things that were once very automatic and easy for them are now becoming difficult. Um, they will at some point become disoriented to time and place. They might have a general idea of what time of day it is, but they can't really guess within the hour like you and I probably could. Um, they are making significant errors with instrumental activities of daily living. And this is when things can start to get dangerous because they might go in the kitchen and turn the stove on intending to cook and then leave the room and forget that they had done that. And that can be a big risk for a fire. They might also begin getting lost when they're out in the community, not being able to keep track of where they were. They might make errors with managing money and forget to um, do different things for their health, like taking medications. At this point, they're probably not able to learn new information. They're probably not going to be working anymore or participating in any complicated activities. Apraxia and agnosia are becoming more evident. And you may also begin to see wandering, pacing, rummaging, delusions, um, and even paranoid behavior. This paranoid behavior is uh, more common with Alzheimer's disease than other dementias, and it usually revolves around theft. Usually the person will think that someone took something from them because they have no memory of misplacing it. Um, you know, you and I, if we lose something, we remember, oh, I, I went to the other room and I 
placed that down there and forgot that I put it there. And oh, I must have done that again. I knew I just did that a few days ago. But this person with dementia, they're not going to have that memory of ever having picked up that object in the first place. So to them, what makes sense is someone must have taken it. So they, they start to develop this kind of paranoid thinking. In the late stage, we're seeing severe memory loss. There may be major language problems. Um, the person might even forget the names of family members, might confuse one person for another, or only get parts of a story right. And socialization depends completely often on somebody else to initiate the conversation. At this point, the person in the severe uh, late stage of dementia is probably not going to initiate conversation and they're going to require a lot of time to process what somebody is saying in order to make a response, um, which can be very, very stressful because if it's taking all this extra time to process and their conversation partner thinks, well, maybe they didn't hear me or maybe they didn't understand and then right away they're saying something else and trying to explain it in a different way, well, then that's something, again, that this person has to try to process and it starts their brain all over again and they never really are able to respond because they're having so much stimulus that they can't process it. Um, this is a very common thing that you'll see with family members um, of, of a person with dementia trying to speak louder or say more to get them to understand when that's really making things worse. So we'll get a little bit more into that later on when we talk about what sorts of adaptations we can teach family to use uh, to be able to communicate better. Uh, at this point, the person can become confused even in familiar surroundings, whereas in the earlier and the moderate stages, they might have just been confused if they went somewhere unfamiliar out in the community. Now, even in familiar surroundings, things are starting to look strange. We can think back to the, the train story in the very beginning, and this is where they look out the window again and nothing looks familiar, and they might even forget that they're on the train in the first place. At this point, they will probably need maximal to dependent care for all self-care, including feeding. So that praxis and that motor planning for even familiar and simple tasks like eating is starting to go. They might need to be fed and bathed completely. They're probably going to become incontinent of bowel and bladder. They may also have decreased range of motion and this leads eventually to rigidity as the muscle fibers start to adhere from decreased movement. They have a lot of motor issues and gait and balance disturbances, very frequent falls and may become bed bound. They may also lose interest in eating altogether because of so many issues with chewing and swallowing. And as we discussed earlier, this can affect um, their safety in swallowing. They might start to aspirate that food into their lungs because they're not swallowing properly. And that can be often the cause of death from pneumonia, from bacteria growing from that food and liquid getting into their lungs. Any questions at this point about the different stages? You're doing great. No. No question, please. Okay, very good. All right, let's start talking OT. <laughs> so, what can we do? We yeah, about, yeah, that's good. Yes, <laughs> we just talked about a lot of things that are very difficult and very frustrating and upsetting to both the patient and to their family. So, what can we do? How can we make this better? One of the biggest things that we do as occupational therapists is support participation in meaningful activities and life roles for anybody that we work with, right? So what does this mean for the person with dementia? This means making things safer and focusing on control. A lot of what becomes very scary for people with dementia, from what I understand, is not being in control of their choices anymore. You know, their family and um, or staff, if they're in a long-term care setting, are starting to recognize that they don't have good judgment, they're not remembering what they need to do, and they need a lot of help. 
And that can be really scary when all of a sudden you go from being independent and doing things for yourself to now everybody's doing everything for you. You have no control over your schedule and your day and your choices, what you eat, what you wear. So we want to focus on maintaining as much control for the patient as possible while still keeping them safe. We're also going to focus a lot on, on adaptation. What can we change about the environment and about the task to make it easier and compensate for their decline in function so that they can still participate in things that are meaningful to them? The most important thing to remember here and to be able to teach family and uh, staff of facilities, other caregivers, is don't do for them what they can do for themselves, or you'll reduce their ability to do it. I'll, I think a lot of the time a family member will see their loved one struggling with something and that's stressful to them. They don't want them to struggle, so they just take over and do the whole thing for them. You know, they might see them struggling, um, trying to orient a t-shirt to put it on the right way, so they just take the t-shirt and they'll just put it on. Whereas what they could do um, is just set the t-shirt the right way in their laps and you know just start to pull up the um, the opening of it and then maybe from there the person would be able to do it uh, and that way they're still doing most of the task of getting dressed they just need that little bit of help they still feel in control they can still do it and maintain that ability to do it for as long as possible because as we know if you don't use it you lose it right if you don't do um, exercise then you're going to lose muscle mass it's the same way if you don't do these activities that engage your brain even if your brain is not working the way that it once did or that it should be you're going to lose that ability and even more so for people with dementia they really depend on continuing to keep in practice um, in their activities to be able to maintain that ability. So we're going to be doing a lot of education with family members on what they can do to support this continuing participation in meaningful activities and um, still keep the person with some control in their life. When and where is occupational therapy needed? There's a lot of people with dementia, right? And we might not get to intervene and help all of them, or they might not need our help. Sometimes family or caregivers have already found ways to work around it and keep them safe and um, keep them with a high, good quality of life. But sometimes if there's a recent decline in function, especially when the person goes from completely independent to there's something wrong, we don't know what to do now, or when the person goes from being in that moderate stage for several years and then all of a sudden they're not able to get out of bed anymore, um, that's when we might be needed. Because at that point, the family and the person with dementia may not be coping with that loss of function and they need some help adapting. So, we might also be needed when their behaviors begin to pose a, a threat to safety, um, either of the patient or their family or the public. Um, and then examples of this, um, wandering is a big one. So somebody starts to be unfamiliar with their surroundings and they're trying to get somewhere where they understand what's going on and they know people. So they'll, they'll leave the house, they'll wander down the street, and then they don't know where home is. That's a big threat to safety, um, especially if there's traffic around or it's an unsafe area. Um, have you seen any examples of this um, in your experiences? Okay, I'm going to go on. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, I want to make sure that you all feel comfortable speaking up when um, you might have something to add because it'll be more fun than just me talking at you. 
Uh, but another example of when we might be needed is if there's a potential for increased quality of life. Um, and this is something that I believe you will probably be able to relate to. Um, I've gone into a couple of long-term care homes before and um, noticed people have spent all day just sitting in a chair or laying in bed and not really doing anything. And I think a lot of it is that people don't really know how to engage them once they've gone into these moderate or severe um, stages of dementia. But there's always something that we can do to increase their quality of life. Um, they might need a little bit more stimulus. Um, if you're sitting in a room all day with nothing, you're going to be bored no matter whether you're cognitively intact or not. And there are different activities that we can find that they may still enjoy. Uh, so our job is to find out what those things may be and how can we add joy back into their lives? How can we get them to engage, even if it's just very minimally in their environment? Uh, where we might go, um, sometimes we can go into the home and that's a great place to do therapy because it's the person's true familiar environment and we can help where it really matters. We may also see the patient in the hospital, usually if they're there for other reasons. Um, uh, people aren't typically hospitalized just for dementia itself, but they may be there because um, they are starting to have those problems with balance and gait and they've fallen and broken some bones. So we're treating them for their orthopedic injuries and helping to rehabilitate them back to life. But we're also noticing this cognitive disability that we can offer some suggestions and help for. And we're going to see a lot of people with dementia, of course, in long-term care. Okay, so the first step of our process is assessment. Just like with any other patient, we're going to start with the occupational profile. We're going to interview the patient and their family and caregivers and find out what's been difficult for you. Um, what sorts of things do we need to focus on? Then we want to observe their participation in activities of daily living um, and instrumental activities of daily living, if appropriate. There are pros and cons, of course, of, of both the interview and the observation. When you are interviewing somebody, they may over or underestimate their abilities, um, and the family and caregivers may do that as well. Um, or they might not really have the knowledge or the verbiage to explain what's going wrong. Um, but at the same time, they can give you a lot of good information about how things go on a day-to-day -day basis that you might not see if you just observe them participating in a self-care task one time. And then when you're observing, you get to actually see and use your activity analysis skills as an occupational therapist to determine where is the breakdown, what's going wrong, what part of this needs to be adapted, what is it in the environment, or about the task or the thing that they're using for the task that's making this difficult that we could adapt. There are also several different standardized tests and checklists that you can use uh, that are very helpful for determining the level of cognitive disability um, or even whether or not somebody has dementia. One of the most common is the mini mental status exam. And this is, we'll go on and, and talk about all three of the things list, listed here. This is a 30 point questionnaire and it's used to help determine cognitive impairment. The pro is that it takes only five to 10 minutes and you don't need any special equipment or training to administer it. It's just a paper and pencil test. The con is that it's not sensitive to mild cognitive impairment. So this is probably going to pick up more so people who are getting towards the moderate stage or in the moderate stage of dementia. It's not really sensitive to people that are just starting to show those signs of cognitive impairment. Uh, another con is that it's highly verbal and it lacks sufficient items to adequately measure visual, spatial, or constructional praxis. So it's going to give you an idea, a good idea of what they're struggling with verbally um, and with the memory, but not as much for those uh, beginning praxis and visual spatial problems. 
This test, at least in the States, is used very commonly with physicians. Um, and I often find myself using the MOCA or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment instead. Uh, it's usually not as common with the physician, so it's a good kind of additional test once they get to the therapist, get a bit more, more sensitive to subtle cognitive deficit. So it's going to be a little bit more sensitive to picking up on that mild cognitive impairment. And um, it's got, as you can see at the top of the picture here, it's got a visual spatial section that's going to um, assess their praxis and visual spatial functioning a little bit more. Again, it's still a paper and pencil task. Um, so it's not quite as functional. Um, it's got a scoring scale here, and the MS MMSC does as well. Uh, I put the one up here for the MOCA because I like the MOCA better. <laughs> so if the person scores 26 or more points, that's considered normal. 18 to 25 points is considered to be in the mild impairment range and so on. Um, when you're doing this, you have to keep in mind that one, uh, we're not physicians, so we can't officially diagnose that somebody has dementia. Usually the way that I write my notes is the person scored within this range, and this is indicative of or suggests mild impairment or moderate impairment. Um, I can't say, based on this test, the person has dementia. Um, that's not within our scope as occupational therapists, so just keep that in mind. And two, this is just a screening test. Um, somebody could do very, very well on this, but still have a lot of cognitive disability that affects their daily living. Or somebody could do very poorly on this, but um, be very good with adapting and compensating for their deficits and doing very well in their functional everyday tasks. Uh, so just keep that in mind. This is a good place to start, but it's not the be all, end all. Uh, next, I want to talk with you about the Allen Cognitive Level Screen. This is also a favorite test of mine. Um, I really like that it's hands on. It uses a leather square, which you can see pictured here, and three different laces. And the person is given instructions and has to do three different types of stitches, which become progressively more difficult. It's a really good, quick measure of a person, person's global cognitive processing capacities and their learning potential and performance and problem solving abilities. Um, and I think that this assessment gives a much better idea of how this person would actually do a functional task like eating or dressing or managing money uh, because it is more hands-on. It's based on Claudia Allen's cognitive disabilities model. So after you've done this test and you've gotten a score, that score correlates with Allen's cognitive modes of performance. I'm not sure if you've heard much about that before. I think that it might have been um, discussed a little bit in some of your prior um, uh, presentations that you've had, but the downside of this assessment is that it needs to be purchased. Um, it comes with a cost. Um, you may be able to make something like it <laughs> um, if, if the funds aren't there to purchase it, but it is definitely worthwhile. Um, it's a very, very helpful assessment. And um, we also have the routine task inventory. And this is a good alternative if you can't get your hands on a leather lacing kit. Um, it also is based on the cognitive disabilities model, but it's a um, list of activities in different areas of occupation, including self-care, IADL, social communication, and readiness for work. And you can complete each item based either on the patient or the caregiver's report or your own observation. The only caveat is in order to give a score in any one area, you must observe at least four of the tasks in each area being scored. Um, so you can uh, fill out the items, other items besides those four based on what the uh, person or their caregiver reports, but you have to observe at least four of the items within that one category. And this uh, assessment is available for free online, and I've put the website there for you. It's very, very in-depth, so it's I think would be a really great place to start with any 
new patient to determine what areas have been difficult for them at home and in the community and what you can begin to work on with them. Any questions at this point or we're still doing all right? Doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Hopefully this is really good helpful right. information. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the role of occupational therapy in each stage. In the earlier stages, our assessment will be focused more on work, home management, driving, and safety issues, because at this point, the person is probably still um, working or managing a household or um, driving if they're a driver. Um, we're going to focus a little bit more on what parts of those activities have become difficult for them. They're probably not really having trouble with ADLs yet, with bathing and dressing and all of those things, so we won't worry about that as much. And our intervention will focus on cues and clues, we call it. So this is the stage where they're just starting to have some difficulty understanding their, um, their schedule for the day, remembering the more complicated parts of their life. So we're gonna focus on labeling, on signs and checklists, um, reducing safety hazards and emphasizing routine. Routine is, is going to be really, really important for any person with dementia. Um, when it becomes harder to recognize things that are unfamiliar, you really depend on the things that are still familiar and on doing things the same way in the same place with the same setup every time um, to facilitate your performance and your ability to recall what you need to do next. And we're also going to focus on supporting the caregiver because this is a big change from the person's independent level of functioning to now needing some help. So we're going to support the caregiver, tell them what resources are out there, what might be helpful to them. So for example, uh, we might have the person start using more environmental aids like calendars and notes. And we might start grading activities for success to decrease anxiety. So we're, at this point, we're going to start identifying what are the things that are really difficult for you? How can we make those things a little bit easier? Maybe we need to replace something that you're used to doing with something else that's not quite so challenging. So if somebody is still working and um, they are in a higher level management type of job, maybe they're not able to do that anymore, but maybe they can still work for that same company doing something um, a little bit more repetitive and routine. Um, and we may also uh, be helping at this point to determine the person's need for more supervision and assist than they had before. They um, maybe at one point were safe to live by themselves and do everything on their own, but now maybe they're needing somebody to check in on them at least once a day to make sure that everything in their environment is still safe and they've remembered to do the things to take care of themselves. They remember to, um, to bathe and to uh, do the laundry and that sort of thing. In the later stages, we're going to be focusing our assessment more on self-care, mobility, and communication, and leisure skills. Uh, in this stage, the person is probably, like we said before, not working anymore. They're probably not grocery shopping and managing their money anymore. They've probably handed those responsibilities off to a family member. So we're going to focus more on how can we keep them involved in their self-care, how can we help them to get around their environment more safely and to be able to communicate their needs so they don't have that frustration and anxiety. So we'll focus on, in the beginning of the later stages, providing reality orientation as appropriate. And reality orientation basically means helping the person to reorient to what's going on where they are, what time it is, what they've done recently, and what they need to do next. Now, in the beginning of the later stages, 
this is appropriate uh, because the person at this point is still understanding and, and trying to be involved in the here and now. However, as dementia progresses and the memory is very impaired, reality orientation can actually become harmful. If it gets to the point where you're reorienting the person continuously and every time they become more stressed about not knowing what's going on or suddenly being told something that's very um, upsetting that they've forgotten over and over again, it can be more harmful than it is good um, to reorient the person to reality. Um, and it can become more appropriate for them to be supported in whatever their own reality is at that time. Um, at this stage, we are also going to be decreasing stimuli and limiting choices to prevent stress. So earlier we were talking about how important it is to help the person maintain control, and we do want to give choices, but sometimes if you give too many choices, um, it can cause the person to just shut down and become completely overwhelmed. So a way of helping them maintain control and not getting to that point where they're overstimulated and shutting down is by limiting the choices to just a couple of meaningful options um, and locking out everything else uh, so that they can still participate in making those choices without being overwhelmed. We're going to guide their participation in ADL. So this can be both you helping the person and educating their caregiver, their family member, the staff of the long-term care facility on how to guide their ADL so that they can still be participating. At this point, it's really important to encourage maintaining a strict routine because even slight deviations from that routine can be extremely stressful and can be triggers for behaviors um, that are very stressful to both the person and to all of those around them. We'll talk a little bit more about behaviors next. And we're going to keep supporting intact skills. So even if this is something very basic that the person is able to do, we're gonna support that and we're gonna let them do whatever it takes to keep doing that. Um, and I think a good example of this that I heard at one point was if the person really likes to make coffee, maybe the only thing that they still remember how to do is to press the on button of the coffee machine. But you're gonna let them do that even if that's the only thing that they can still remember because they're still involved in that very important activity. If they drink coffee every day, you're still helping them be involved in that one very meaningful thing. And it might not seem like a big thing to a lot of people, but it can be. Our intervention in the late stage, um, when the person is to the point where they might not even be walking or talking much anymore, we're going to focus a lot on caregiver support because at this point, this is now a full-time job, essentially. Um, and this, even more so than a full-time job, this is something that they cannot walk away from. They can't go home at the end of the day like you can from other jobs. It's a 24 seven thing. And this can be super stressful um, to caregivers to never have that time away to take care of themselves. So we're going to focus a lot on supporting the caregiver and helping them find options for respite. And respite means time away for taking care of yourself and getting the things done that you need to get done to keep functioning well in your life um, as the caregiver. We're also going to focus on positioning and movement to pre prevent contractures. Um, and this is essentially to prevent pain during um, care of the person. So if they're not moving much um, and nobody is moving their limbs for them once they're unable to, they can become contracted and then every time that they need to be bathed or moved to be cleaned up, it's going to be painful, it's going to be harder. So we're training the family members and the caregivers on how to safely perform that range of motion and prevent contractures, prevent 
bed sores from being in the same position all the time. Uh, we're also going to provide appropriate sensory stimulation, again, getting into that um, quality life of life and promoting comfort and joy, even when the person has lost a lot of their capabilities. Uh, we have to remember and we have to teach people that they are still a person. There's still a person in there that you can interact with, even if you're not seeing much response. Okay, and uh, when the person gets to the stage that they don't understand a lot of what's going on around them and they're having a very difficult time of communicating their needs, we can see what um, are often referred to as disruptive behaviors. Uh, and these are really a result of cognitive impairment. And possible different things that you might see are pacing and wandering. Um, repetitive verbalization, that really agitated behavior. You may also see some aggression, whether hitting or biting or making threats, um, inappropriate um, verbalizations and touching. They may also be very passive where they withdraw into themselves or they're tearful or they're wringing their hands or picking their teeth constantly. And you may see paranoia. They may have some delusions and hallucinations. The most important thing to understand about this is behaviors are a way of communicating unmet needs. So what do we need to do in response? We need to try to figure out what that need is. We have to try to figure out what the trigger is. What happened to make the person start behaving this way? And what do they need that we can help them with? Often communication uh, are often just, I'm sorry, behaviors can be a way of trying to obtain a sense of control or security. And the person doesn't understand where they are, what's happening, so they're trying to um, obtain that control of their environment. Or they might be looking for affection or some sort of purpose. They need something to do that feels purposeful to them when they've lost a lot of their ability to engage in what used to make them feel purposeful and productive. So we need to consider the environment and their current situation. Are they soiled? Is the room too hot or too cold? Are they having pain that they can't communicate? Are they in an unfamiliar place or routine? So keep this in mind when you're starting intervention with somebody, when you've just met somebody and they don't know you yet and how scary that is. Take time to build that rapport because they might be slow to process stimuli. So even if you just sit with them for a while initially until they kind of get used to you and then maybe start speaking, give them time to process. Um, you might also see disruptive behaviors when you or the caregiver is conveying frustration. So although it might seem that somebody with dementia um, doesn't understand what you're saying, and they might not, they still can understand your facial expressions. So when we're working with people with dementia, especially in the later stages, we have to be very, very careful of what our face is and what our tone of voice is saying to them. Even if they don't know what you're saying, if you say it in a calming way, if you speak slowly and quietly, they're going to be more likely to feel calm and not anxious. Uh, keep in mind that sudden touch may be very scary. Um, so make sure if your job is to um, help them with some self-care tasks that you are easing into that touch. You know, that you're not just suddenly removing a clothing piece and starting to bathe them. That can be very scary. Uh, remember that speaking too fast or giving too many directions can be very um, anxiety producing as well. Make sure you're speaking in brief sentences, uh, repeating the same words if repetition is necessary. You don't want to give them something different to say or to understand. Uh, the environment might also be overstimulating or understimulating. <coughs> Um, as dementia progresses, the brain has a harder time processing everything that's going on in the environment. Um, and some of those 
stimuli may need to be removed. We might need to dim the lights. We might need to block out some background noise. Um, or the person might be um, behaving in a way that increases stimulation if they have been in the same position all day and nobody is talking to them because they're not able to talk back, they might be getting bored or very anxious about not doing anything or having any kind of communication. So they might be behaving and acting out in order to get some stimulation. So what can we do then to help provide some good stimulation for them? And these are some strategies for managing behaviors. The first one, do not try to change the person's reality. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the reality orientation becoming more stressful than it is helpful at some point. Um, it's better to try to join them where they are. So for instance, um, you want to state that you can see that the person feels worried or anxious or upset. You're joining them where they are. Don't ask why, because they might not be able to tell you why. That might be very stressful that they can't tell you why um, they're doing whatever it is they're doing or saying. So here's a very good strategy. Validate, join, and redirect. For instance, you see that um, a patient is very, very anxious, and they tell you, I'm looking for my children. And you know that their children are not there or that um, their children live far away and they're not going to come. So you might say, you look worried, and then you can join them. And you can say, you're looking for your children? I'm looking for something too. Let's look together. Because if you tell them your children aren't here, chances are that's going to be more stressful. Um, or you might need to just keep repeating that and they're not remembering it and that's going to be very frustrating for both of you. So instead you're joining them. You're, you're looking for something too. Let's look together. And then you're going to redirect them. You might say, let's look over there where those people are having coffee. So this now changes the person's focus from where are my children? I need to find my children. And that stressful way of thinking to let's go over here with some other people and oh, let's have some coffee. And to be honest, this doesn't always work. <laughs> Sometimes the person is just too anxious to be redirected, and that's okay. Sometimes you just need to be with them and, um, and not even say anything, uh, and just be that calming presence for them. And it's always good to reassure them, tell them that they're safe, and that you are here to help. Uh, calming stimuli might also be helpful. Um, again, low lighting, maybe calming or familiar music or objects in a calm approach. And I also want to mention um, a couple of other things having to do with managing behaviors. Whenever possible, avoid restraints. Oftentimes restraints can make behaviors worse and can actually be dangerous. So we always want to avoid restraints whenever possible. There is also another uh, phenomenon that can sometimes happen called sundowning. And this is a tendency for increased agitation in the afternoons and the evening as nighttime is approaching. There's a couple of different theories as to why this happens. Uh, but some strategies for what you can do um, is to increase light exposure during the day and only uh, have the patient engage in low demand acti activities after 6 o'clock. So you're helping them orient to the bright light during the day, it's daytime, and then after six o'clock, now we're transitioning to nighttime, we're doing calming things um, rather than things that will increase their agitation. You also want to try to limit daytime naps. If a person really needs to nap during the day, morning and early afternoon naps are better because if they're napping closer to nighttime and then waking up again because it isn't nighttime yet, um, that can be really anxiety producing because then there's that disorientation of what time of day is it? Is it nighttime? Is it daytime? Um, I know I've experienced that when waking up later than I normally sleep or at a different time and it, it is very disorienting, but then I'm able to reorient myself and remember, oh, I fell asleep, it's this time of day, this is what I need to do now. 
the person with dementia may not be able to do that, and that can be very anxiety provoking. Okay. Do we have time for more, Kate, or do we need to be done within the hour? It is up to you. Um, if you have time, by all means, it would be wonderful for you to continue. This is a okay. recording, so people can log off if they need to go. Okay, good. So I also had in mind a couple of um, situations or kind of case studies that we could discuss. Um, because there aren't very many people, this might not be as helpful. Uh, but we'll kind of talk through them just a little bit, maybe. So in our first situation, the person becomes very angry and defensive when unsuccessfully trying to cook a meal. So I've got some questions here. I'd like to talk about why, why might this be happening? Daniela, do you have any ideas? <laughs> or have you experienced anything like this before? No, no, not really. But maybe in a different situation, but not with dementia per se. Okay. So in, in my experiences, things like this can happen when somebody is starting in the earlier stages of dementia and something that used to be very easy and automatic for them is now becoming difficult and confusing. And they might respond by being angry and defensive because they don't know why it's difficult. So how could we adapt the task or the environment? Do you have any thoughts? Okay, we, we could um, try to adapt the task by bringing the, the related items together. Maybe if we will group the vegetables, we'll group the whatever they need to do to be able to cook. Maybe we'll group them so that it will be easier to locate where they are. And maybe when we look at the environment, we'll look at where the shelves are, where the pipe is, all those areas, if maybe they are far, they are frustrating, we try to bring it closer or verbal cues as well. That's what I can think of. Yeah, I think those are great ideas, just creating more organization in the environment, taking away some of the mess and the stress, um, especially if it looks anything like that picture there. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about another person who lives alone and his home is very disorderly and dirty. Last week he missed several shifts at his job and when his boss questioned him why he wasn't there, he couldn't really give a good reason for not being at work. So what might be happening with this person? What do you think? The person is depressed. Yeah, this depressed. Does, it does sound a lot like somebody who could be depressed. What do you think you might be able to do to help this person? Or what would you tell their family? Say their family is very concerned about them and doesn't know if they can really live alone anymore. Can you come again? Uh, can you please come again? Sure. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Daniela. I think uh, Paulina might be here too, and feel free to chime in if you're able yes. to, Paulina. Um, so yes. why why do you think that this might be happening, and what could you do to adapt um, this person's environment? How could you help them as their occupational therapist? Oh. 
So I have a couple of thoughts for this person. Um, if their home is very disorderly and dirty and they're not making it to their job, um, my thought is maybe they are also beginning in that early stage of dementia where their everyday tasks are starting to become very overwhelming um, and they just don't know where to start and it's affecting their ability to get up in the morning and initiate their morning routine to get to work on time. Um, so I think we can maybe adapt their environment uh, by offering a little bit more assistance to help them with some of the household tasks like laundry and cleaning. Um, they might also be at the point where they need some more uh, cues in their environment for what needs to be done next. They might need some checklists of what chores have to be done that day that they can then check off to remember what's been done and what needs to be done. They may, they may need a better system of waking up for work um, if they're no longer getting those internal cues from their brain that, okay, it's morning, I need to go to work. They might need a better alarm clock. They might need a family member to come to their house at a certain time if they're able to and make sure that they're awake and ready um, to go to their job if they're still able to work or if they're not able to work anymore, they may need their therapist to be an advocate for them um, and help them find something a job in their job that might be more appropriate for their current skill and functional level um, or to be able to replace that purposeful um, meaning that their job gave them with something that can also give them purpose in life. Let's talk about situation three. So this person lives with her daughter and she needs some help with caring for herself. So immediately I'm thinking she's probably in more of the moderate stage for dementia. And her daughter tells you lately she's been refusing to take a shower. And her daughter is very frustrated. Uh, she wants to help her mom. She wants to help her take a shower and be clean and feel good. So why do you think this might be happening? Or have you heard anything similar to this before with patients? So what can happen in the later stages of dementia is that immersion in water or water on the face or the head can be scary. And the reason for this might be that it's a very sudden change in stimulation. So the feeling of the water, um, if it's not um, anticipated or understood why the purpose of that water um, on the person that can be scary and stressful. So something we can do to adapt the task is to suggest maybe the person doesn't need to shower anymore. Maybe we can just do sponge baths at the sink and, and help the person clean that way. Um, or if you know they really do need to bathe in the shower, maybe we can just start with the feet. If you start with the just the lower, um, areas of the body first, I'm going to move because there's some background noise here, <laughs> uh, then the task might not be as scary. It's not as scary to have water just on your feet um, as it is to have it suddenly on your entire body. So maybe what we can do is just start by bathing. Uh, our network is very bad today. It's not, we are not having a stable internet connection. Oh, okay. Would you like me to wait for a minute, or? Oh, it's it's a, it's a stable now, but maybe we don't know. Okay. We keep going and coming, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'll keep going, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear the recording a little bit better later. I'm sorry about that. I know that's frustrating. Um, yeah. 
So another example of what you could do for this person who's refusing to take a shower um, is maybe you could keep part of their body covered um, and just watch one part of the body at a time because maybe they're reacting to um, being exposed and being cold. Um, so maybe we can put a towel or a blanket over them and then just uncover parts of the body um, at a time. Our last situation is a person who has been leaving her house and cannot find her way back home. The neighbors and the shop owners in town have had to guide her back home several times over the last few days. So this is a big safety issue. I think we talked a little bit before about um, this issue of wandering and what, yeah. why this might be happening. Um, the person might under, not understand where they are and they're searching for something that's familiar. Um, even if they're in their own home and it's not looking familiar anymore, they might think that they, there's something they need to be doing. Um, they might be used to going to work every morning, so they might be leaving the house to try to go to work, even though they haven't worked for 30 years um, or whatever it might be. So, um, Daniela, if you can hear me, <laughs> have you um, any ideas of what you might be able to do to adapt the environment for the person to help them stay safe? Yeah, so maybe um, we can introduce sign, sign, or you can put a tag around her hand. So as she goes about, the tag will be there. And then we can also do a little bit of change in her room so that she will be able to locate the door and the gates if possible. Good, yeah, I agree. Um, and I've actually seen a lot of both of those things. Um, there's uh, different um, things that you can have the person wear and you can even make it look like jewelry, um, look nice, that has their name and their address uh, or a phone number on them in case they would wander and get lost um, and not be able to tell somebody who they are and where they live um, to help them get home. Um, there's also different things you can do to the environment to kind of disguise the door in a way so that that trigger of the door um, triggering the person to want to leave and walk out the door because they simply see it there um, is not there anymore. <laughs> so, uh, for instance, you could paint the door to be the same color as the rest of the wall so it doesn't stand out as much. Um, I've also seen a um, stop sign or a dead end sign placed on the door so that instead of triggering the person to walk out of the house, it's triggering the person to avoid it and to go the other way. And that can be helpful sometimes. Um, so just a couple of different thoughts on common situations. And I have just a couple more slides here, a couple parting words. So in addition to working with patients individually that have dementia, we um, can also do some other activities to help these people in this population. We can educate the public about the cause of dementia and how to effectively communicate with and help people with dementia, because this can be very confusing for people that don't have a medical background. You know, they, they see somebody who isn't uh, responding the way that other people do to conversation um, and doesn't know what they are and um, aren't able to take care of themselves, that can be confusing. So what we can do is educate the public, tell people what dementia is, what causes it, um, you know, that it's a medical problem, that it's something biological in the brain that changes their ability to do common things that the rest of us can do easily. And even just knowing that for some people can be a big change um, in helping them to uh, respond appropriately to people with dementia and help them stay safe. And uh, we can also organize activity groups for people with dementia. And research has shown that people with Alzheimer's tend to prefer handling and manipulating things rather than engaging in conversations. So good activities for them could in include 
um, exercise groups or simple games that they can uh, manipulate things with. Um, reminiscence groups can also be really good because a lot of the time people with dementia do have intact long-term memory. They can remember things that happened when they were children, even though they can't remember what happened this morning. So it can be good to facilitate um, conversation about reminiscing about earlier in life and what they enjoyed when they were younger. We can also lead family and caregiver support groups. Again, this is a very, very difficult disease to deal with and the family and caregivers of these people um, need a lot of support, both in providing respite for their loved ones and also in how to deal with this on a practical everyday level and how to cope emotionally with the changes that they're seeing. And finally, we can be advocates for the needs of people with dementia and um, what we can change in the um, environment, in the public, in the community um, to help them be able to participate more in um, daily life. And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about prevention because although it may seem that dementia is unavoidable and that once it begins, there's not much you can do to treat it, there are some things that we can change in our lifestyles to either delay its progress. And this can include diet. There are actually different foods that you can eat that can reduce your chances of getting dementia. And I'm looking for my last notes page here. I'm sorry. Yeah. So a really important part of the diet for dementia prevention is antioxidants. And these are found in a lot of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we also want to include healthy fat and omega-3 fatty acids instead of saturated fat. So this means um, healthier fats like um, olive oil instead of animal fats, um, which are more saturated fats, and avoiding butter, because that's a lot of saturated fat. And exercise is also really important. Aerobic exercise especially can help delay the onset of dementia, and this includes walking and biking, swimming, even housework, um, strength training, and balance training. Uh, stress reduction is also very important because the hormones that our body produces when we're under a lot of stress have been correlated with um, the onset of dementia as well as a lot of other diseases like cardiovascular disease and stroke. Sleep is also very important. Uh, sleep is the time that our memories are consolidated. So there's a strong correlation between sleep and memory. Um, and brain function. And there's also been some research that engaging in complex mental activities and memory training can also delay the onset of dementia. Um, so the more that we do to challenge our brains, uh, the more likely they are to stay strong and um, not be affected by de dementia as easily or as quickly. So this, those are my final comments. <laughs> are there any other questions or Anything else that you'd like to talk about having to do with dementia and OT? Yeah, thank you so much. And I wanted you to comment on more on the complex mental activities because as seen as a community occupation therapist, I see a whole wide range of people. And especially for stroke and for those stroke so that okay i heard most of what you said i think danielle um i heard the last thing i heard was that you um, see a lot of people with stroke um so what uh, what we're talking about here with compl complex mental activities um, is more for people that have not had any signs of dysfunction yet. Um, and what we can do is educate people 
to make sure that they're exercising their brains um, and um, continuing to challenge their mental functions. And this could be trying to learn something new, like learning a new language or um, going to classes or picking up a new hobby. All of these things are very good uh, ways of challenging different areas of the brain to keep them strong and to keep those neural connections going. Um, for people that have some sort of disability and dysfunction already, such as from a stroke or a brain injury, it can still be beneficial to try to challenge their um, mental capacity, but you might need to adapt those activities uh, so that they can participate them within their um, functional abilities that are remaining after the stroke or whatever the injury may be. Well, thank you, Stephanie. This was really great. You are amazing. Thank you. It was really good to be here and I hope that it was helpful and that the recording will be helpful as well since our attendance was a little bit low today. Well, absolutely. And you know what, if Daniela or um, Paulina have any more questions because the internet is giving us a little bit of trouble, you will be CC'd on the recording that goes out. So everyone will have your email if they have questions, if that's Perfect. okay, just email you. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thank you, Stephanie. Thank, thank you. you. Good to see you, Daniela.